Tonight I'm going to try and tell you how, uh, how we measure the microwave background polarization uh, in, in particular. There's been a recent um, discovery, uh, in March 17th actually, the BICEP2 experiment discovered something having to do with the microwave background polarization and I hope by the time you leave here you'll understand that and appreciate the excitement of that. I'm going to talk about, in, in, while doing this, I'm going to uh, hit on uh, two experiments that I'm involved in. One is called the South Pole Telescope. This is a very large 10 meter diameter telescope that's actually at the South Pole and has been there for a while. We've been using it to study the microwave background. And another is a balloon borne instrument, which we call SPIDER. Um, and that's another one that we're using to uh, measure the microwave background. And so the, the, uh, I'll, I'll be talking generally about how we do these measurements, but then specifically hitting some things having to do with those two instruments. Now, as Glenn talked about last week, the cosmic microwave background is this leftover radiation or light from the Big Bang. And today, we can measure its spectrum. The intensity is a function of wavelength, if you look up here at this scale. And this was done fantastically, as he mentioned, by a satellite called COBE and a particular instrument on that satellite called FIRAS, which was uh, the, the PI of that, uh, of that instrument was John Mather, who got the Nobel Prize for this spectrum right here, showing that the microwave background was a perfect black body, or at least as perfect as we can tell uh, a black body. A beautiful measurement that really tells us that the early universe, in order to produce this black body, had to be in thermal equilibrium. In other words, it was everything was all mixed up in the same temperature. And that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, he is, by the way, currently the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, Senior Project Scientist. Uh, you know, he's a Nobel Laureate who's still going on to do other good things. Uh, and as you see here, the, the, this Today, this spectrum peaks near a wavelength of two millimeters. So this is going to come up over and over again in this talk. But you know, you can measure it all the way from one millimeter out, and with other technologies, you know, down to uh, ten, ten millimeters or something like that. But you know, you can actually measure its brightness, so you up for even a larger range of wavelengths. The power, and this was asked last week, the power in this black body, if you went out into space and, and asked how much uh, power is hitting a square meter or is hitting the square meter of the Earth, or it is about 3.3 microwatts per square meter. That's really, really small. We right now are radiating about 500 watts per square meter, each one of us. So our thermal radiation that you would see if you had one of those cool infrared, uh, you know, night vision goggle type things would, uh, is, is just blowing this out of the water. Okay, so it has really no impact on, on the earth in sense of, you know, heating anything up. And it makes it very hard to measure because it's so weak. Now, if you could go out into space and you could look around with microwave eyes and you could identify every photon out in space that was with the microwave background, here is what you would see. Okay? It looks kind of crazy. Uh, I don't know why that one is white. <laughs> but they're traveling, they fill space. It's a sea of photons filling space, traveling at the speed of light, of course, going every which way. Okay? If you asked which ones do we have a chance of detecting, those are the ones that are pointed at Earth, okay? So we don't see the ones that pass by Earth, right? But then we trace those. If we see those with our telescope, we can think about where they came from and we would trace them back along their path and they have traveled for the last 13.7 billion years or so, unimpeded, not scattering off of anything. So we can trace them back that far, that far away, that far back in time until they last scattered off of electrons in the early universe when the universe was still a plasma. Okay. So Glenn talked about this last week, uh, but what we're gonna talk about this week is an interesting thing that now we believe actually really happened. We've been wondering for a decade uh, whether we could see this or not, but with the bicep result, we think it really happened, that there may be gravity waves left over from inflation, that crazy epoch in the early universe, when the expansion uh, went exponential, really hyper fast expansion. And if that's, uh, if, that's, if that's right and there are gravity waves left over, maybe they have some impact on this plasma that we could see, that we could figure out what that is. And in fact, we believe that there is a way that we can use the plasma back there when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old as a gravity wave detector. So let's talk about that a little bit. If we go back and we look at the electrons in that plasma, okay? If you have an electron in the plasma, or, or a cloud of electrons, and there's a bunch of other plasma around it, but it's all the same temperature, 
what happens is that the, the, this hot part of the plasma around this thing is, is sending photons down towards this electron, and that electron will scatter it, th those photons, some of them into our line of sight, so out of the page here towards you guys. And if there's a uniform glow around this elect set of electrons here, though, the light that gets scattered towards you is unpolarized. Okay? But if it's not uniform, if you have hot spots, say, on the top and bottom and cold spots on the left and right, then the photons, you know, there's more photons coming from the top and bottom here trying to shake this electron there, than there are from the sides. And in that case, the light scattered outwards towards us can be polarized or is polarized. So we can use the, the, you know, the light coming out, its polarization, the stuff that's coming from those electrons to our telescopes, we can ask, is there polarization there? And if there is, that tells us something about the environment around that little cloud of electrons. Okay? And I'm going to really go through this a little bit quickly, but basically there's light coming from the cold spots. They shake the electron up and down. There's light coming from the hot spots. They shake it side to side. The ones coming from the top and bottom are stronger, so there's more side to side shaking. That makes a horizontal polarization coming towards us. So, Gravity waves can actually make that kind of environment for us. So if you have start out with a space that is uh, not being stretched at all by a gravity wave, and you have uniform temperatures all around this, this uh, cloud of electrons, but then you have a gravity wave go through space right where that uh, the cloud of electrons is, it will stretch space so that this happens. OK, and you recognize the pattern. Gravity wave leads to this variation of temperatures around that, that set of electrons leads to polarization. So we have known now for 20 years or something like that that if we were really good at measuring polarization in the microwave background, then we could try and see a signal that's due to gravity waves passing through that plasma. When I first heard of this 20 years ago or whenever it was, I kind of laughed. I was like, yeah, right. We're never gonna, we, weren't, we weren't measuring polarization at all. We were just trying to measure the intensity variations of the microwave background. The sensitivity you need to do this sounded crazy at that time. Okay? But nonetheless, the idea now is that you have us on the little blue dot right in the center. This is the surface that we're probing around us, the sphere around us that we're probing when we look at the microwave background. Here's a cloud of electrons there. There's a gravity wave generated at the first instance of the universe, you know, at that epoch of inflation when the universe was very, very young, near t equals zero. And that gravity wave creates the variations in brightness or in temperature around that cloud of electrons, and it sends a polar, polarized light signal to us. That's what we want to do. Now, there's a problem. The problem is that this is not the only way. Gravity waves are not the only way to generate such a pattern around those electrons. There is a uh, unfortunate fact that the regular density perturbations that Glenn talked about last week that create the maps that, uh, that, that he showed with the, that the Planck satellite and WMAP and other, uh, many of us have measured nowadays in intensity variations of the microwave background, those density perturbations, which later grew to be clusters of galaxies and galaxies and everything, they also create these, these patterns around electrons, and that's annoying, right? They're hiding our gravity waves. How dare they? But fortunately, there's a neat mathematical property of the, of the patterns that are produced by those density perturbations compared to the ones that are produced by the gravity waves. So here are two patterns of polarization that you can look at. And what's neat is that uh, this one on the left, we call E mode, and it looks the same in a mirror, right? It, it, would, it would look, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell if you were looking in the mirror or not. This one, if you put a mirror to the side and looked at it, you would see that the handedness of the spiral would flip sign, it would flip sense, right? So this one looks different in a mirror, and it turns out that density perturbations can only produce patterns like this that look the same in a mirror. Gravity waves can produce both kinds. So if I go out and I map the microwave background polarization and I see this kind of pattern, I've seen an evidence of gravity waves traveling through that plasma. Now that's pretty cool. So all I have to do is go out and measure this, right? And, uh, and I'll be using the plasma as a gravity wave detector. 
Now, an another way, this is one way of looking at this, but I want to I introduce a different way of looking at those patterns, okay? So first, let's look at a, um, a pattern of a simulation of what microwave background polarization might look like on the sky. And it turns out that if you predict what's out there based on standard cosmology, that E mode pattern, the one that's made by, uh, by density perturbations, really dominates the sky. You can't tell it here without doing a bunch of math. But, uh, but you can see just a bunch of polarization bars here showing that the light is polarized this direction with some strength right in that spot, you know, et cetera. And we can take a map like this and we can break down you know, how to make up this map out of E mode patterns and, uh, and uh, B mode patterns, okay? So let's think about polarization waves of different types in that map. And then we're, what we're going to do is make up the map out of a sum of all sorts of different waves like this. So here's what's called an E-mode wave. It looks the same in a mirror. Okay? So it's, uh, it's oriented like this. This distance from peak polarization in one direction to the same thing over here, that's the wavelength of this thing in my map or the angular scale of that variation in the map. Okay? And here's a B-mode one. If I put that one in a mirror, all the little regions are going to flip their sense. And so it looks different in a mirror. Okay? So here it is. There's a, and then it still has the same wavelength, but this is an E-mode pattern. That's a B-mode pattern. I can make up a map of all sorts of combinations of these, but I have to include ones, waves that are of different wavelengths. Okay? To, you know, is there, are there big variations, big long waves in my map or short waves in my map? So this is just a scaled by PowerPoint version of the same thing where the, the only thing that's really changed here is the wavelength is shorter in this image. And it turns out I can make up that previous map out of just combinations of different wavelengths of things. And what I can ask is in that map when I make it up, how important or how strong or how big an amplitude are the waves of different wavelengths? So I'm, for wavelength here, I'm going to call that in this next plot angular scale. And I'm going to plot something on angular scale on the x-axis versus how strong or big an amplitude or how powerful is it on the y-axis. And this is a little bit of a complicated plot, so I want to go slowly through this. But standard cosmology predicts these strengths of those waves for the E modes, okay, that's that red line, and you can see that those have a lot more strength than what I expect to see for the B modes. There are actually two sources of the B modes, unfortunately. I told you about the one from gravity waves. That's the one that we want to concentrate on here that today. That's the blue curve right here that would be telling us about gravity waves from inflation. If I looked in my map and I saw some amplitude here uh, or size or importance of waves of some angular scale right here, uh, then, then I would be saying, oh my gosh, I'd be I, in their B modes. Then I would say, ah, I've detected this signature of inflation. But there's a confusing thing right here. It turns out that these E modes, the ones caused by density perturbations that exist in the, you know, due to just normal stuff, not gravity waves in the early universe, they get morphed a little get, bit by the structure along the line of sight. So photons traveling to us from the early universe, they know that they just passed by a cluster of galaxies, say, and they bend a little bit. So I take a pattern that had, if, in the, if I had a pattern that had no uh, B modes in it, okay, no B modes in it at all, say, and then I lensed it, I made a distorted image of it from all the gravity potentials along the line of sight from, from, uh, from large scale structure, then I would still get a little bit of B modes just because I moved where all the photons are. And this is what I would get from that action, okay? But there's this place in here where the blue curves have ch a chance to stand out above this foreground right here. And so this is where we've been searching for a long time in this region. And this, this is hard to do except for from a satellite, but from the ground, we've been searching in this region to see if we can detect that signal. So the rest of the talk is going to be about how do we go after, how have we been going after this signal and what can we get from it? What is polarization? You can get polarized sunglasses, uh, so for optical light. Pol polarization is, um, is, a is a preferred direction of the electric field that's associated with the electromagnetic wave, which is light. So um, all light has electric fields associated with it that are, that are um, oscillating, going up and down in, in size. Okay? If you look at water with the sunlight glinting off the water, 
the electric field that is one of those orientations, and I always forget which, is, is, uh, is more preferentially reflected. The other one tends to go into the water uh, rather than reflect off it. And so that's why you could, you know, fishermen get polarized sunglasses so that they get less of a glare off of the light, so, or off of, off of the water, so they can see into the water and see the fish. So uh, polarization is just a, a, a particular orientation of the electric field. You can break it down light into whether it's vertically polarized or horizontally polarized, for example. How much of it is vertical, how much of it is horizontal, and then, uh, uh, and, and you'll understand then, you know, uh, what, what exact form of light you have. Does that help at all? A little? Got to get some polarized sunglasses and actually see how they, how they work, and, and, and you'll, you'll start uh, feeling good about it. Hello. Uh, last week, we were told about sound waves in the early universe. Is it at all possible sound waves could be taken for uh, the B waves? These are different in that it is the, the, the variations in density and temperature that Glenn was talking about last week can be thought of as sound waves. And they propagate through the universe. And, uh, and those cause those temperature anisotropies. Right? Here we've got a different thing it's, it's the, 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 that's traveling through the universe that's causing the, the deformations of space that lead to those variations. Right? And I am not sure whether they actually then ring like sound waves after that. Can, are you? Sure. <laughs> it's a really a ambiguous. It's it's a good question. So I'll not answer it. Which way are the gravity waves oriented that they cause a visible polarization of the background? Is it the gravity waves that are coming toward us or the ones that are going transverse through our line of sight? It's it's the ones coming towards us or away from us actually. It's a good question, you know, or have some component of their direction in that way. If they're going around on the line of sight, then they can only squeeze things or stretch them, you know, along our line of sight or perpendicular to it and we can't see that action effectively from the uh, from the plasma. That's right. So we we sample some section of the gravity waves. Let's proceed. Um, now we're going to talk about now that we know that this signal may be there in the microwave background polarization, let's talk about how you actually measure it. Okay? So if you're going to measure CMB polarization, you need three things. You need a super sensitive camera for light that is roughly two millimeters in wavelength. But of course, you could, you could look anywhere near that, that the microwave background is bright. You need a telescope, of course, that uh, works for that kind of light. And then you need to take it somewhere other than Cleveland. Okay, now Cleveland is at basically at sea level and there's a lot of atmosphere and there's a lot of humidity and it turns out that that's, that's very bad for our measurements. So first let's talk about how do you get a super sensitive camera for two millimeter wavelength light. So you need something that detects that light, a very sensitive detector of that light. And how do you do that? Well the most sensitive way nowadays to do that is something very ancient which is to have a block of stuff that absorbs the light and you put a thermometer on it. Now you can do this yourself uh, in the, in, at shorter wavelengths in the infrared by building a fire in your fireplace, closing your eyes and moving your hand around and seeing whether you can actually find the fire. Now I'll guarantee you, you can find the fire, right? You can, you can sense where it's warm. You're, you're, you have nerves that are basically a thermometer that sense warm and you have a hand that's absorbing the radiation, the, the light from that fire. We're doing the same thing, we're just a little bit more sensitive than your hand, okay? So we, what we do is we use the telescope then to funnel the CMB photons down onto that detector, okay? and, uh, and, and so that they get absorbed. And what happens is that the photons, the CMB photons, get absorbed by the block of stuff. The block of stuff, because the, those photons had energy, it heats up. And as it heats up, we just read out the thermometer and sense that temperature rise. And that tells us that we're pointing at a place that was a little bit hotter than we used to be pointing at. Okay? All right, so we've got this thing that we want to build now. We want a super sensitive thermometer though, more sensitive than our hand. We want the block that we're going to do this absorbing with and sensing the temperature of to be very small and very cold, it turns out, in order to have the CMB photons heated up as rapidly as possible or as much as possible, right, to have as much effect on it as possible. And also, it turns out, by getting really cold, you get rid of a lot of sources of noise, thermal noise. So we win in a couple ways by making our, our 
uh, our block of stuff really cold. The other thing we want to do is we want to put this detector, you know, the heart of our camera, in a place where it can't see any extra photons from our hot environment. Remember, I was mentioning before that we're, we're sitting here and our temperature is about 300 Kelvin and we are radiating at all sorts of wavelengths and we're radiating about 500 watts. The microwave background is only uh, you know, a few microwatts per meter squared or something like that. And, it, and so it would get dwarfed by all the radiation from the room or, your, or the inside your telescope or something like that, unless you arrange such that your detectors don't see all that stuff. Okay, so we're gonna try and put our, the heart of our camera in a very cold place to make the sensor as sensitive as possible and to get rid of these extra photons. So here is a picture of the current camera or, or focal plane that's on the South Pole Telescope. This is a polarization uh, camera that we installed in 2000, or had first light in 2012. What you're seeing right here are, uh, are pixels or, or you know, detectors, uh, or actually feed horns that feed the light down into detectors. They're sensitive to two millimeter wavelength light in here and three millimeter wavelength for these ones out here. So the idea is that the light comes in from the big telescope and it makes its way down to this and then that channels the light down to a very sensitive detector or a very sensitive block of stuff that heats up with it. We have a thermometer on it, okay? The current state of the art here, by the way, is only about 1,000 pixels in a camera. That's nowhere near as good as you know, my iPhone, <laughs> which has megapixels. But unfortunately, these are a little bit more you know, difficult to build and, uh, and, and they, we have to cool them to a fraction of a degree Kelvin in order to make them work. And so they, uh, they tend to be bigger. They're really bigger pixels than the ones in your iPhone because the light is bigger as well. Okay, so the, you, in your iPhone, you're looking at things that are thousands of times smaller than the light that we're looking at here. So the detector here tends to be thousands of times bigger than the one in your iPhone. Here is a picture of a wafer of such detectors. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to see exactly what's going on here. But nowadays, we, we do make these in a silicon fab lab. These ones were made at NIST, well, National Institute of Science and Technology out in Boulder, uh, Colorado. And it takes a few years to make a, a wafer like this or to develop the ability to make a wafer like this. And then if you want to make more of the same thing, it takes sort of a month to make a few of them. This one right here has around 100 of these pixels on it, and each pixel has two detectors attached to it, one of which is gonna sense one polarization of light, one direction of oscillation of the electric field, and another of which is gonna sense one orthogonal to it, so that we can tell whether the light is polarized or unpolarized. Do we get more signal in this, this polarization or that detector than this detector? If we, what's happening here is there are funny little, uh, you can see a four-leafed pattern right here in the center here. That, those are actually an antenna that sits at the bottom of the horn. And then the light actually couples into the antenna and goes through some little wires that are evaporated on there and gets deposited in these little structures out here. I'm gonna show you a zoomed up version of one of those structures. This is what it looks like. It's a small thing. Remember, small is good because that means the microwave background power can warm it up fast, okay? So only 300 microns across or something like that. The light actually comes on little wires that, that, that's uh, coupled on, on uh, traveling as electric fields on and electromagnetic fields on these wires and then gets absorbed in these little meandering lines right here. And there's a super sensitive thermometer on board this little, uh, this little silicon island right here. This is a, a, what we call a superconducting transi transition edge thermometer. Superconductors change their resistance really fast with temperature when you get right near the transition temperature. So it's a way of having some physical phenomena that's very sensitive to temperature, makes it a very good thermometer. Okay. So that's our thermometer. This is where all the light gets absorbed. This thing heats up a little bit. It's allowed to heat up because this blue thing out here is a silicon wafer, that thing that we were looking at before, the, that's actually cooled to about a quarter of a degree Kelvin or so using fancy refrigeration. And then there are these very thin legs that, that, uh, that is suspended over. And this is actually empty space around the rest of the structure, the black stuff. And so this thing can heat up and, uh, and, and uh, you know, above this temperature right here. Okay. Now, this, you want to put this thing, you have to cool it, first of all, to 0.28 Kelvin or so. And you want to put it, uh, couple it to, a, to some cold optics uh, in your telescope. So here's a picture of the spider uh, optics, or one of the spider telescopes. And this is a graduate student from Princeton, one of our collaborators that's working on this. Uh, there's a refrigerator down here that does the cooling to 0.28 Kelvin. 
This is the, the spider detectors are a little bit different, but the same idea. They're made on silicon, and they're, they're sitting here in these four black squares. So this entire block of, uh, of copper right here is cooled to, um, two point, or to 0 0.28 Kelvin. And the telescope is, uh, is up here. The telescope in spider is actually the whole thing. The lenses and everything is cooled to four, to four degrees Kelvin. So very cool. And how do we cool it to four degrees Kelvin? We stick it inside a big thermos bottle, and we fill it with liquid helium. This is a big liquid helium door that holds 1,200 liters or so of liquid helium to get everything down, the cameras and their optics and everything down to four degrees so that those really cold, really super sensitive detectors don't <coughs> see all that warm light from the room. That's why we do that. Okay. All right, so you, um, we've been through how to make a very sensitive focal plane or the guts of the camera. Okay, you need that super sensitive thermometer, small block of stuff. And now we need to couple the light to that, uh, to that camera. So you need a telescope. This is a picture of the South Pole telescope. It's 10 meters across. It needs to be a good telescope for light that's two millimeters in wavelength. Okay? Not the light that you see with your eyes. So therefore, it does not need to be shiny or nearly aligned or you know, nearly as smooth as an optical telescope mirror. The, this, this is made up of all sorts of little panels. They're about three quarters of a meter or so in size, something like that. And they were machined on a, on a numerical mill. So just, just rough, I mean, it was fancy German machining, but, uh, but nonetheless just made on a, on a uh, cutting, with a cutting tool like that. And, uh, and, and then they were all put together in 2007, all in one summer season. And that's me uh, standing there just for scale. The light comes from the sky. This is actually showing the telescope pointing at the horizon, but the light comes from the sky, bounces off of this reflector, and comes down into a cabin that's right down here, the receiver cabin, we call it. And here's a sideways view so you can actually see what's going on there. Light is coming from the sky, bouncing off it into this area right here. And because this operates at the South Pole, where it gets down to around minus 100 Fahrenheit in the, in the winter, we want to make sure that all the moving components and all the sensitive electronics and everything is not hanging out in the breeze. So we make sure that everything that's like that is inside a warm room. So the camera lives inside a warm room right here that travels with the telescope. Incidentally, this structure here weighs about 700,000 pounds. So the only way at that time to get uh, stuff to the South Pole was to fly it there in C-130s. These are ski-equipped planes right here, the biggest ski-equipped plane that you can find on the planet. They carry about 25,000 pounds each, so that whole telescope had to be constructed out of parts that were less than 25,000 pounds and then put together at the pole using cranes and that kind of stuff all in one summer season. We go down there in November or so, and we can work through the austral summer when it's daylight there and warm there. And then we have to leave by mid-February. So that's the amount of time we had to get this whole thing working the first time. Spider, on the other hand, is an entirely different beast. Spider flies on a balloon. So Spider uses little tiny telescopes, it turns out. They're only about a foot in diameter. Okay? And, but all the telescopes are cooled to four Kelvin. So here's Spider with that liquid helium cryostat that I showed the back end of before. Mounted on a, a gondola, we call it, that, uh, that uh, flies underneath a balloon. And the, each of these six independent telescopes, the imagine one more right here, uh, you know, takes light from the microwave background, funnels it down through a refractor telescope to that sensitive array of detectors. Okay? Um, the weight of spider can be no more than about 5,000 pounds. Otherwise, the balloon won't get off the ground. An interesting thing about these, uh, these optics, this millimeter wave stuff, is that we make things out of, uh, the, that are in the optical train. You know, this is a window for spider that the light passes through that are just completely opaque to our, uh, our eyes. But two millimeter wavelength light doesn't see this. It just passes through fine. So a lot of our optical components, you'd be surprised. You say to yourself, what, what are you doing building a telescope out of that thing? But it doesn't matter that optical light that we see with our eyes doesn't go through this. The millimeter wave stuff goes through fine. And I have a couple other things up here that afterwards, if people want to look at, you can come up and we'll do some show and tell. I'm going to talk about BICEP2, uh, by the way, and the, the, the spider system is a sister experiment to BICEP2. Uh, and so, so a lot of what I say about spider will apply to BICEP2 as well. A lot of the telescopes and detectors and things are all jointly developed at Caltech and JPL. Now, OK, so that's the we need a good telescope that works for two millimeter wavelength light. 
Now, what else do we need? We need a good observing site. So, the atmosphere is our enemy, like many, but for different reasons than, than most optical astronomers. It turns out that the atmosphere emits and absorbs and emits at various wavelengths. So just look up here and see two millimeters right here. And this is the amount that it will either attenuate the light or it also emits this much at sea level versus going up to four kilometers altitude. And so this factor of 10 or so in emission is very important for us. This is why we can't operate in Cleveland. Really, some of this is due to oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. Some of it's due to water. So I like to say that uh, CMB cosmologists would be much happier if the Earth had no oxygen or water vapor. <coughs> the South Pole is one place where we can go where there's almost no oxygen or water vapor. It's at about 10,000 feet effective altitude. It, tur it's the, it turns out it's a little bit more than that most of the time. The Earth's atmosphere bulges at the equator due to the rotation of the Earth, and so therefore it thins at the poles. So sometimes the effective altitude is as much as, uh, as 12,000 feet. And the water vapor is really frozen out because it's so cold there. So they're very low humidity place. So all those water vapor lines that were in that previous spectrum, they're greatly reduced. It's the best millimeter wave observing site in the world, especially for this kind of science. Spider is a balloon. Well, if you don't like the atmosphere, why not go above the atmosphere? Well, we can go above sort of 99% of the atmosphere or so in a, in a big balloon. This, uh, the, the advent of long duration ballooning, balloon flights that last a couple weeks or so, or maybe a few weeks, uh, um, that started about hmm, 15 years ago or something like that, 20 years ago. And they've gotten very good, NASA's gotten very good at launching a few of these payloads a year. They go up on the coastline of Antarctica and they go around Antarctica one, two or three times and you can get long flights out of them. It floats at about 120,000 feet which is about 20 miles up in the, in, the, in the sky. And so you're above almost all of the, of the atmosphere. But you can't put a 700,000 pound thing on them. You have to have a lightweight instrument. And finally, if you have all the money in the world, you can go to space, okay? There is no atmosphere in space. Um, you can observe the whole sky without interference from the ground or anything, you know, and you have lots of time out there. It's expensive though, and it takes a long time to build a satellite to the specifications required by the space agencies, either the European Space Agency or NASA. And so you end up flying it and it has old technology on it by that time. So sometimes the ground and balloons are a better way to do the science. How do you keep it cold? The detectors? Yeah, the detectors the go pole. down <laughs> a quarter of a degree, but then you're going to take it out. I mean, even though Antarctica is cold, wouldn't that be like putting it in an oven? No, it lives inside that thermos bottle. Well, and, and what we have to do is we have to we have to funnel the radiation, the, the light, into that thermos bottle, which is a vacuum. We have to pump all the air out of it, get it cold, and then we have to get the light in. And so we use materials like this. This is just a foam. It's kind of like styrofoam, but it's a very special kind of styrofoam. It turns out that two millimeter wavelength light passes through this and less than 1% of it is absorbed. So we can build a system like that where the detector is in a big vacuum bottle, kept cold, and the light gets into it. Do you get interference from atmospheric electric phenomena like the aurora? It turns out that that's not very important in the millimeter waves. And so as far as we can tell, we don't see anything unexpected from that. We haven't done an experiment to see how well we could you know, limit that in the sense that we haven't sat there looking at the atmosphere and had an optical camera and observed and seen, you know, tried to correlate the images or anything like that. But we certainly don't, we don't think there's particularly bad data, data from high aurora days. It sounds like from a perfectly simple uh, explanation that you could get a cluster of balloons and uh, float this building. Okay, so that, that's an interesting question. Those balloons, one of those balloons to lift a 5,000 pound science payload, it has a bunch of other stuff too like their NASA's communication stuff, a parachute, we hope, uh, you know, things like that. Um, one of those balloons uh, is the size of, uh, you know, a football stadium by the time it gets up to float altitude. So those are big balloons. And it would be, and, and one of them, the launching of one of them, just one of them, is both a beautiful and somewhat terrifying event. It takes about an hour from the time they've laid out the payload and you're, you're on the launch pad and ready to go, and they have you hooked up and they, they wait till the winds are right. 
right means as still as possible, blowing in a steady direction at a very low velocity. If, uh, you know. And then they lay out the balloon such that the winds are pointing from the balloon to the payload. And they have to lay it out, and then they have to start inflating it. It's a lot of helium to put into the balloon, so it takes a long time. And the balloon slowly starts to rise, and they're holding it at the end of the balloon there on a thing they call the pin with a big, huge weight because there's a lot of lift, right? And eventually, when everything's ready, they start up the launch vehicle that the, that the payload's sitting on, and they let go of the balloon, and the balloon takes 30 seconds or so to come up slowly over the payload. Then you drive around underneath it until you're right underneath the balloon and let go. And then hopefully the payload goes up and doesn't swing down and hit the pavement or something like that. So you can launch one balloon, but I would be uh, amazed if somebody could launch two balloons at the same time tied together. That would be quite a feat. I was just curious how permanent uh, an installation the South Pole Telescope is. It's been there since 2007. Um, we, the, the, there is a drifting issue where all buildings there uh, slowly start to get covered by the wind-blown snows and everything. Uh, that takes, we, we, other buildings down there and facilities have lasted you know, 10, 20 years before they had to be jacked up. We actually have provisions for lifting the telescope and putting you know, uh, extensions on the legs so that it can actually continue to be jacked up. And I think in reality what's gonna happen is that as long as it's scientifically useful, and compelling because the National Science Foundation runs the science on the continent. So as long as you can write proposals that say, please continue to fund us, it'll, it'll be down there. And as soon as that you know, is no longer a compelling case, then they'll let it sit for a couple of years and go, oh, we gotta take this thing down. And, and uh, eventually it will be retro. I'm sorry if I missed this last week. Are there a finite amount of photons? How do you know when it comes and hits the earth that it hasn't hit anything else beforehand? Okay, yeah. The, the, if we work out the math having to do with those photons, like when they were generated in the early universe, and we know the density of stuff in the universe, and we know how fast the universe is expanding, then we can calculate what the probability is that some photon you know, will hit anything between us and then. And it turns out that because these are very low energy photons and because the universe for a long time was just neutral hydrogen gas and hadn't formed stars or planets, and because stars and planets and everything are so far apart now, there's, the universe is such an empty place, that only a very small number of them, way less than a percent, I don't know what the number is, 10 to the minus something big number, uh, actually ha will, in that journey, interact with anything. Most of them just freely travel. So it's our calculations of that. And then also measuring that spectrum shows us if they, if, if they interacted with stuff, they would get energy from the stuff along the line of sight. So that pure black body spectrum tells us that we are really looking at the, the original photons without much interaction at all with anything along the line of sight. Let's move on then and we will talk about the, you know, what we've learned, especially recently, from studying CMB polarization. So about 10 years ago or so, Many of us started to think about whether we might be able to see, build instruments that were sensitive enough to be able to see this B-mode polarization signal from the microwave background that would tell us about gravity waves, that would tell us about inflation, okay? And so at about that time, a bunch of people started thinking about instruments, proposing them, and even starting to build them. And the BICEP crew, uh, which made, made their, uh, their data release uh, last month, uh, really st started earlier than other people. Most other people thought that, hey, we, you know, we shouldn't get started yet because we're not ready enough. The, we, the, we can't build systems that'll get to the predicted level of signal. They, they got an early jump and they led the field in terms of getting significant amount of sensitivity, you know, good cameras on the sky. There is, however, a whole slew of other instruments that have been going after this signal for a while and really just, just recently have gotten on the air, you know, actually starting to do observations. The reason why there's a whole bunch of these is that it's an exquisitely hard measurement to do. There's lots of opportunity to mess up and to have your instrument uh, inject some kind of false signal and to, and to make a mistake, right? And so these are not, on scientific project scales, these are not super expensive uh, efforts. And so the, the powers that be at NASA and at National Science Foundation have chosen to fund a variety of them to, that are taking very different technical approaches towards doing the measurement. And in some cases, like with SBT, are doing other science as well. 
not just going after these, uh, these signals. Other very compelling signs in, in some, of these, uh, some of these measurements. But nonetheless, there, are, there are, you know, are a bunch of us that are going after this. Well, on March 17th, 2014, the BICEP crew uh, announced their discovery of this signature of inflation, okay, of a B-mode polarization signal that looks like it, like that one, at least uh, you know, in their data, looks like the one that, uh, that was predicted by these uh, ideas of inflation. This is, as I just said, a very, very difficult measurement. And so we really, uh, everyone in the field really believes that we need confirmation of this. And then we need to ask, once we confirm it, improve the measurement a little bit, what else, you know, what, what, what's next? What after that? So let's go back to that plot that I showed before. And you can ignore the red and uh, green lines at this point. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to see this signal right here uh, on the blue line. And if you notice, what's, I've got two lines drawn here. That's because we didn't really know, and it depends on the model of inflation, how many gravity waves, how the strength of the gravity waves that would be created at that epoch of the universe. And if you make different amounts of gravity waves, then you can make this signal stronger or weaker. More gravity waves stronger, less gravity waves weaker. And so here's a range of things. And we parameterize this by a number called r. Don't worry about why it's called r. But here's a curve drawn for r taking a value of 0.01. So that's a certain amount of gravity waves. And here's a curve drawn for r equals 0.2. That's another set of gravity waves. Okay? More r, more gravity waves, bigger signal, easier for us to see. So we would like to measure this, how many gravity waves were produced. That's one thing that we would really like to figure out. Now, the BICEP crew and most of us, in fact, uh, every, everybody doing this measurement uh, that's, that's really on the sky yet or you're observing yet, is going after a particular region in, uh, of this curve. And it's going after, I want to point this out now, there's this multipole number L. I'm going to have to do this because of the next plot, where this peak right here, this bump, is near a little bit shy of L of 100. And I want you to remember that because of the next plot. And there are particular reasons why lots of us were going after that, that signature rather than this one. This one's hard to measure because you need to measure the whole sky or some huge fraction of the sky. It's very hard to do from the ground or from, uh, from balloons. That's a satellite type thing. And there are no satellites that were really uh, built to do this science. So you see here that what's, what, what you expect, if you are measuring B modes, you expect a peak over here in the green. Okay, those are the ones that are not due to inflation. And then a dip, and then another peak if, if, the, if you have this value of R. Okay? And the bicep data, I'll show you the bicep data now. See, this, uh, this is the multipole L right here. And it's, it's, there's a peak in this dashed red curve and in their solid black point data right near the right angular scale predicted by the inflationary signal. Okay, this, this uh, piece out here, the solid red line, is the other version, the non-inflation piece of it. Uh, but you, what you can see is that their data points, the black data points, ignore the rest of them, the black data points are way above this line. There, it looks like there's some extra signal on these angular scales, few degrees angular scales on the sky, that's there in this funny flavor of polarization that looks different when you put it in a mirror. Okay? And this is amazing because the, uh, the universe has given us a rather direct probe of inflation, if this is true. So if this is true, the value of R is 0.2. That's why that one blue curve was at the level of 0.2. This is actually larger than we expected. So there's some interesting things about why didn't we see this before with other, other forms of data, non-polarization kind of things. Um, but uh, the BICEP crew uh, thinks that it's at this value. One of the things we learn, if inflation is a simple model, the, the, the simplest model of inflation, then we learn the energy scale associated with inflation. And what we learn is that the energy scale associated with inflation is this big fancy number, 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV. The Large Hadron Collider has energies of order thousands of GeV. Okay, so this, you know, and this is 10 to the 16. So that is a, uh, a, a ridiculous. Uh, amount of energy density. Um, a trillion is 10 to the 12. Okay, so we're talking about 10,000 trillion a GeV. A GeV is the rest mass energy of a proton. So if you were at this time of the universe, you could create things just sort of out of all the energy that was in that soup that were a, uh, 10,000 trillion protons in mass or something, just ridiculously high energy particles. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so that's neat. And it's crazy high scale physics that can't be probed with accelerators. But nonetheless, people have thought about it and realized there might be this signature of something interesting happening there that was motivated by other observations. And they predicted this signal, which before it was discovered, was, was everybody was talking about it. If we find this, this is the smoking gun of inflation. And then it was discovered. An amazing feat of science, right? Uh, now, we need to find out, is it really right? Did they make a mistake? It's a really hard measurement to do. So confirmation by their experiments is going to be important. And if it is right, can we learn anything more about inflation? So let's talk about uh, what we're going to do first to, with our other experiments to figure out whether they were correct. Now, I'm going to show you a map of the southern sky. Here's a map of the southern part of the, of the sky with this being the south celestial pole, which is straight up at the south pole. And here are a bunch of different overlays of regions that will be measured by uh, different experiments. Um, this region that's got the fancy map in it is something that was measured by the first camera on the South Pole Telescope, which did not have polarization sensitivity. So you can ignore that, I guess. But, uh, but it's a pretty picture. This little box right here is a, a field, a 100 square degree field, that we measured two years ago with the South Pole uh, Telescope we ha with a polarization sensitive camera. And we've been analyzing that data. We've put out one paper on it. Unfortunately, it's too small of a field, too small of an area to really look for this signal. Last year, though, we observed this 500 square degree field, which overlaps with the, uh, very much with what BICEP measured, the piece of sky they measured. So we can check them not only in the sense of uh, do we see B modes, but we can say, do we see the same ones? Right? Do, do we see the same polarization on the sky as, as BICEP? And we're pushing, we have a graduate student who's working really hard right now trying to get our maps to the level where we can actually compare with BICEP. And then with Spider, because of the, we're balloon born and we have to fly during the summer down there, we actually can't overlap with that field right there. We can have a little bit of overlap, but we're going to measure more sky. That's actually important because by measuring more sky, it turns out that with the signal this large, we'll get smaller error bars. Okay. All right. And Spider, by the way, I didn't mention it before. The, the plan with Spider was to fly it last year in December of last year. The federal government shutdown happened, and just as we had shipped everything to the South Pole, it got as far as New Zealand. The government shut down for 16 days, and during those 16 days, they had to go and care, to care, caretaker status in the, on the continent. They actually pulled people off the continent that were doing preparations for our season. And when that all got done, uh, they decided, they thought about it for a week or so, and decided they couldn't gear back up again, so they canceled the ballooning season. So now we are planning to go down in uh, this December and, and map this region with Spider. If BICEP 2's detection is real, these exist. These BMOs, the signature of inflation exists. And so we're very interested in what else we might do with it. Can we measure more precisely how strong the signal is? Can we measure whether it's tilted one side or does it have a different shape or something like that? Because it turns out that those details tell us something about the physics that drove inflation. So we've got this new handle now on what drove inflation to happen at that very early time in the very early universe. So now there are many of us who are, our excitement is renewed over this field and over the prospects for learning more about the early universe. And, uh, and we're thinking about what can we do to even do better on this front, to measure this more precisely. And to give you a little history of progress in technology in this field, in the way of building sensitive millimeter wave cameras, here is a millimeter wave camera that uh, I built with uh, one other guy back in uh, 2000 or so. It had 16 detectors on it. We were, like, we were massive. We were the best in the world at that point with 16 detectors on our, on our telescope. And then uh, in 2007, we built a, a, a camera, our collaboration built a camera that had almost 1,000 detectors in it, but they didn't have polarization sensitivity. Uh, the camera that we put on in 2012 had you know, nearly double that number, but the really cool thing was that it had polarization sensitivity. We have, a, we have just been funded a, a little while ago and have started working on building a next generation camera that will have about 10 times the number of detectors here. The more detectors we get on the sky, the more sensitive we get, the better we can do these measurements. And the technology um, it, it, uh, ability here, the sensitivity, 
has really followed a Moore's Law kind of path over the past few decades. Here's the, the last uh, you know, decade and a half been projecting into the future, but this, this kind of plot keeps on going backwards uh, all the way back to 1960 or so. Uh, the idea is that on the y-axis here on the log scale is the raw sensitivity of a given experiment that we're able to field. And on the x-axis is the, is the year. And what you see is that this is going, you know, you're improving by a decade every five, or by a factor of 10 in your sensitivity or so, every you know, five years or a little bit more than that or something like that. We have gotten down from, this was a satellite experiment, and we are down here in this region right here right now. Okay? The camera that we're funded to build already is this region down here. And then people are starting to dream about what's the next generation thing. So we think that there's great prospects for continuing to bring more and more uh, sensitive instruments to this problem of exploiting or of, uh, of looking at this wonderful signal that the universe has left us that tells us about this very earliest time that we can probe. And that's going to be an amazing future. So I'll stop there. And I want to stop and, uh, and take questions. But I also want to note that these are projects that are done with a fair number of people. Lots of young people love to go into this field. Here's some graduate students of mine working on the spider instrument. Um, some various uh, people, including graduate students of mine, uh, down at the South Pole, and there are winter overs. And, uh, and, and the people doing this are toiling away very hard. Uh, doing things ranging from building fancy, detec fancy detector arrays to, uh, you know, like I am here, greasing telescopes. Uh, but hopefully, we'll be able to continue to improve the measurements to the point where we can tell more about the early, early universe from this amazing signal it has left us. Thank you. <laughs>